Hello, and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election season is well underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, new borough presidents, many new city council members, and more. That's not all that's on the ballot. There's also another very important election happening in the city, specifically in Manhattan, but not for a city government position. There's a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan District Attorney, the top prosecutor, the top law enforcement official of New York County, also known as Manhattan. It's a position of immense power and importance. The office holder makes key decisions that impact the lives of many New Yorkers and millions who don't live in the borough or even the city. Millions of people who call Manhattan home, who work there, or who just visit the borough. Their decisions of life and death, freedom, incarceration, crime, punishment, and more. It's one of the most high profile and important criminal justice jobs in the country. It's technically a state level position, so there are slightly different election rules at play. For example, there are no term limits for the Manhattan District Attorney and candidates for the office have different campaign finance rules than are at play for city government positions. And although ranked choice voting is starting this year for city government posts in special and primary elections, there is no ranked choice voting for Manhattan District Attorney. But the primary for Manhattan DA is happening this year at the same time as the city government elections with a June primary and a fall general election. So it's okay if you didn't get all that, you can find it all online. But what we're here to do is introduce you to the candidates. The most important thing is that you know that the primary is coming up in June and it's time to get to know those who are seeking your vote. So we're pleased to bring you this series of interviews with the candidates running for Manhattan District Attorney as well as interviews with other candidates for other offices, including mayor. These one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you to get to know the candidates, learn about their backgrounds and platforms, where they stand on key issues, and in this case, what kind of district attorney for Manhattan they're promising to be if elected. So we hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make an informed decision when the time to vote arrives. So let's get to today's conversation. Joining me by Zoom is Lucy Lang, a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. Thanks so much for being with me today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Ben. So you are running for Manhattan District Attorney. Uh, tell folks a little bit about what brings you to this race, who you are, where you come from, your background, some broad strokes, and then we'll get into a lot of specifics. I was a kid in Greenwich Village. I'm a parent now in Harlem. I've been a teacher in New York's prisons, an assistant district attorney who's responded to violent crime scenes all over Manhattan, and a reformer who's worked with district attorneys across the country. And I wanna tell you why the district attorney's office matters so much. The United States is unique in the world in that we elect our district attorneys. And that means that it's you, the voter, who get to determine who it is, who is the chief law enforcement officer, who determines whether charges are brought, what charges are brought, what services someone gets, and how victims are supported. The survivors, families, and incarcerated New Yorkers I have worked with over my career serving Manhattan have taught me that community-based solutions and restorative justice are vital to addressing trauma and preserving dignity to make our city safe and healthy. That means treating kids like kids, treating substance use and mental health conditions as health problems, and ending mass incarceration. It also means transforming how people are treated in prison. I'm an advocate for restoring the right to vote for incarcerated people while they're incarcerated so that their voices have to be considered by people who are looking to leave the system. Imagine how different our system would look if people seeking elected office had to enter the prison system and talk to their constituents there about the policies that they sought support for. I'm gonna tell you a story about when I was an assistant district attorney that informs part of how I think about the role of the DA. The role of the DA encompasses far more than prosecution alone. And here's one example of a time that became very clear to me. A number of years ago, I responded to a terrible homicide scene. 
On Super Bowl Sunday, on a snowy night, two masked gunmen came out from behind parked cars on Upper Broadway and opened fire, hitting five people and killing one young father. I worked closely with the families of the victims over the course of a long investigation, became close to the mother of the young man who'd been killed, who was raising her grandchild. And ultimately, I tried the case of the two gunmen and a jury returned a guilty verdict. The morning after the jury returned the guilty verdict, I called the mother of the young man who'd been killed and asked her how she felt. She said, I slept all night for the first time since my son was killed. But when I woke up, all I could think about were the mothers of those two boys, referring to the two men who'd just been convicted of killing her son. It was that compassion that illuminated for me some of the blind spots that exist in the criminal justice system. And that motivated me to build a first of its kind college and prison program, to bring assistant district attorneys inside prisons to work alongside incarcerated New Yorkers, to study criminal justice together and develop ideas for change. Collaboration with communities is at the core of what I bring to my campaign for district attorney. And I'm honored to have the support of people who have been most directly impacted by the system, including families who lost loved ones to police violence, like Valerie Bell, Sean Bell's mother, Victoria Davis, Delron Small's sister, and Valerie Castile, Philando Castile's mother for the work that we did together to create best practices for how prosecutors can ensure accountability. I'm also honored to work, uh, have worked alongside survivors of Harvey Weinstein with whom I built a plan for a new sex crimes unit for the district attorney's office and have received the endorsements of progressive prosecutors from across the country who are doing the job that I seek to do and hope to have your support in doing. Thanks for that overview. Appreciate it and introduction. Um, so you've been in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Broadly speaking, is that office in need of major overhaul, significant change? You know, how do you capture it for sort of a regular voter who says, boy, I'm watching this election. It seems like everybody thinks the, the office is totally off, needs to needs an overhaul. Everybody's criticizing the, the current district attorney's side advance all over the place. What, what's it really? I mean, how much of an overhaul does this office need? And what are the biggest pillars of the change that you think needs to happen? The opportunity for addressing the change the public is calling for is remarkable in the district attorney's office right now. And I'll give you a few key examples of areas that can have great impact uh, through the DA's office. One is through equal access. And I launched the campaign with an equal access policy to ensure that there are no backdoor meetings, no matter who someone is or who their lawyer is. And that everyone, regardless of their pocketbook or their power, receives the same access to the district attorney and senior staff. And there will not be decisions made behind closed doors without transparency. That's one opportunity. Another is for drastic reform of the sex crimes unit shifting towards a survivor-centered model, the one that I have built alongside, uh, I built a plan for alongside survivors of Harvey Weinstein based on our work together with trauma experts and directly impacted survivors. So those are, those are two big pillars. When you, when you think about um, taking over at the district attorney's office, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, don't know that it's a very large office, well over a thousand employees, uh, a budget well over a hundred million dollars a year, plus hundreds of millions of dollars in, in settlement funds and forfeiture funds that can be used. Talk a little bit about managing that office and, and the types of, um, you know, instructions, protocols you might change, instructions you might give ways that you would uh, talk to your bureau chiefs or, or assistant district attorneys about changing, you know, some of the sort of culture of the office. Having served in precisely the office that I'm now seeking to lead, I am aware of where the levers are that need to be pulled in order to enact the change the public's calling for. And it's that awareness that has led me to roll out a number of plans that are consistent with how I intend to do that including drastically changing the legal training to be mission aligned with the philosophy of the office rather than solely uh, legally oriented. I have rolled out a plan that includes how to build a mission aligned diverse workforce that is inclusive and reflects the diversity of the city that the office serves. I also have created the role of a prosecutorial ombudsman who would be an independent person 
whose job it is to take complaints from the public, the defense bar, or anywhere else about any allegations of prosecutorial misconduct. And that person would have the authority to go directly to the ethics committee without coming to the district attorney. All of these things will function to help change the culture of the district attorney's office in a way that is consistent with what the public's calling for while also uh, adhering to the public safety standards that the district attorney is committed to protecting. Are there things related to instructions to ADAs that you would do around plea bargaining, around other aspects of really the sort of nitty gritty day in day out work that the office does on cases? You know, so many of the cases that the office deals with obviously don't go to trial. Um, what kind of reforms, um, maybe there's also, uh, you know, some key crimes that you, you know, want to list that you would no longer prosecute or that you would really seek to divert in, in the m many cases that the office deals with, what kinds of changes are you looking at making? I start from the core value that the office needs to take as a stated priority, ending mass incarceration. And when you work backwards from that, it means that there has to be transparency about plea bargaining. There has to be uh, set standards for how cases are handled. And there has to be absolute transparency with discovery materials, which has to be handled, handed over fully and completely. So all of those things are areas where I would make an absolute uh, distinct policy change. But perhaps more importantly, there is this component of culture and building a culture that is aligned with um, community-based prosecution that creates an incentive structure where assistant district attorneys are not, not gauged based on the number of cases that they try, the number of cases they present to the grand jury, but rather on the depth of their engagement with the community, on the number of cases where they, that they don't bring because there's inadequate evidence, on the number of cases where they conduct a full and complete investigation, and on the ways in which they support victims of all crimes. You know, some of, the, some of the things you've already said about what you just outlined there about your evaluations of ADA is sort of getting away from, a, you know, very sort of uh, basic uh, metrics of, of, you know, cases uh, prosecuted, um, the infusion of what you call, you know, sort of the mission driven approach. When people hear those types of things, I think there are plenty of people calling for those types of reforms. I think there's other people who might say, I want my district attorney to really focus on prosecuting crime, getting criminals off the street, uh, getting guns off the street, you know, and, and there's a lot of reform talk, of course, in this primary. What do you say to the folks who are worried about the reform talk or who, who are a little bit worried about the direction that a lot of the, the candidates in this race seem to be sort of taking the conversation? I'm the candidate in the race who has responded time and time again to Manhattan's hospitals to meet a grieving family or a young person who is suffering from a non-fatal gunshot injury. I bring to this campaign the gravity of the job of the district attorney and the core mission to keep the city safe. We are at 14 year highs in terms of gun violence and I have a comprehensive plan for how to respond to that increase in gun violence, including building a fast track gun court with trauma informed staff that especially trained in identifying root causes of gun violence and creating interventions to stem the tide of the cyclical nature of gun violence, which includes working closely with community based organizations. Yeah, great. That's that's kind of where I wanted to head next in specific. So let's let's hear a little bit more about that. What are what are some more pillars of that plan? And if you could maybe talk a little bit about how you see the district attorney's role in terms of you know, preventing gun violence and also punishing it when it does occur. Um, and, and if you can as well, you know, one of the other things I can also bring this back up after your next answer, but, you know, there's, there's also concern about sort of the basic um, gun possession cases, the sort of run of the mill, the guns might not even be loaded. Uh, it's a young kid who gets, you know, caught up moving a gun around. Again, serious issue but very different than the people who are pulling, pulling the triggers, um, you know, how you would sort of differentiate there. It's a great example of why the role of the prosecutor matters so much, because since the earliest days of the American Republic, American prosecutors have been vested with tremendous discretion in whether to charge cases and how to charge them. And in New York state, the minimum permissible plea bargain once someone has been charged with first time gun possession is two years in prison. 
This is causing a cycle of young people through the prisons that is not doing anything to stem the tide of gun violence and goes precisely to why we need dedicated trauma-informed specialists who are uh, equipped to work with people who are at risk of committing acts of gun violence rather than relying on outdated mandatory minimums that simply perpetuate the cycle. What do you seek to do? You know, first time gun possession charge, someone who's, you know, 22 years old, gun isn't loaded. Uh, what, what does that look like under your leadership of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office? I start from the presumption that we have to address the scourge of mass incarceration and that the DA's office can be instrumental to doing that. For first time gun possession, uh, two years in prison in many cases is simply not the right result. And we need to identify alongside clinical experts and community-based organizations what drives the decision to pick up a gun. And we have to make sure that whatever we do is dedicated to getting that gun off the street and making sure that it is not part of the cycle. There are outstanding models, including in Brooklyn, for the use of restorative justice to address just that type of issue in order to prevent the kind of cycle that we've seen historically. And what about cases where, um, where guns are, are used, where people are injured or killed? You know, how do you approach those prosecutions? And are there any other crimes? Um, and we'll get to sort of the you know, so-called white collar crime in a minute. So leaving that aside, but are there any other sort of um, you know, traditional sort of street crime that you're also focused on making sure that you're prosecuting in a, in a fairly aggressive way as you're also trying to institute many of these reforms that you've mentioned? I spent most of my career working closely with victims of domestic violence. And those are some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers to whom the next district attorney owes a, a, a great commitment. And uh, we have seen an increase in domestic violence during this time of the pandemic that is going to have generational trauma that we need to address. And so domestic violence is an absolute priority in my administration and will be something that I invest tremendous resources in to ensure that every case is handled appropriately and thoroughly and that survivors in particular and their children are given the resource and support that they need to succeed. Just back to the gun violence question, because I obviously I emerged and, and sort of uh, prompted you to, to talk about other areas. But, uh, you know, are there are there gun crimes where you'd seek to prosecute, you know, to the fullest extent of the law? There is, you know, you, you obviously mentioned that, um, you know, on some of the gun possession cases, for example, you think the, the mandatory minimums are too harsh. But what about in the other direction? I handled a case in which a young woman was shot in the back more than 10 times and in her own, uh, the lobby of her own apartment building. And it was a case that remains unsolved because the community was afraid to cooperate against the person responsible for her death. The district attorney's office has to build the trust necessary with communities to make sure that cases like that can be solved and prosecuted and people can be held accountable. There is no place for gun violence in our city. And we have to keep guns out of the hands of, of New Yorkers. So many of these guns are coming in from out of state. We need to focus on trafficking, but we also need to make sure that communities are equipped to cooperate with investigations into instances of tragic violence. How would you handle uh, people who um, seem to be suffering from mental illness, um, but are also violent? Uh, there's obviously been a good bit of attention on the issue in recent years, especially um, a lot of discussion from the mayor to the police department to also prosecutors and uh, all of the above have to be part of, of the solutions here. You know, these manifest, uh, you know, manifest itself sometimes in random attacks on the street in the subway, uh, other events, uh, what's, what's your philosophy? I know this is a very sort of broad topic and question, but how are you thinking about how to handle that? Mental health challenges are public health challenges and need to be treated as such. So I'm committed to creating pathways from people who are suffering from mental health challenges into public health systems where they can get the wraparound services that they need. I'm proud to have worked alongside a group of interfaith advisors to help build a mental health policy for the campaign. And that includes 
taking a housing first approach and diverting resources so that people are able to stabilize and then get the services they need in their housing. It also includes working with clinicians because lawyers are not the best equipped people to assess what someone's needs are. We all know that the criminal justice system is replete with people suffering from mental health challenges and it should be a top priority of the next district attorney to create pathways for people to get the treatment that they need because the way to address violence from people suffering from mental illness is really through prevention. Let's talk a little bit about what I mentioned before, which is um, you know, typically called white collar crime. Uh, how would you, are there areas within that, you know, fraud, cyber crime, money laundering, uh, there's, there's a long list, but are there areas within that that you think the Manhattan District Attorney's Office either has been too aggressive, needs to be more aggressive, uh, areas where you would really try to focus in in a different way? Uh, what are you thinking about on that front? Under my administration, the District Attorney's Office will focus intensively on white collar prosecutions. And that's going to have to include the expertise of cybercrime experts as we see cybercrime in particular um, blossoming during the pandemic. That includes everything from the distribution of um, child sexual abuse materials to identity theft of of elders who are at risk and vulnerable because during quarantine. All of these things are, um, are problems that are reaching crisis levels during the pandemic and by dint of people's confinement. So the next district attorney is going to have to commit not just to the large scale white collar prosecutions to which I am 100% committed, but also to the individual on the ground victims, particularly in vulnerable populations. Are there, um... Are there, are there types of white collar crime other than cyber crime that you think have been under investigated uh, by, the, by this office? Are there, you know, obviously this office is part of the borough of Manhattan where you also is home to Wall Street. It's also home to City Hall, by the way, and a lot of government offices. Um, are there other areas in terms of public corruption, in terms of money laundering, uh, insurance fraud, other, other issues that you think have been under, under examined by the office? Public corruption, money laundering, tax fraud, none of those will be tolerated on my watch. And one way to ensure that that's true is through equal access to the district attorney and senior staff. There can be no more backdoor meetings between senior members of the district attorney's office and well-heeled white collar defense lawyers. In, in terms of the structure of the office, is there, are there any uh, changes that you think need to be made other than, you know, beefing up uh, cybercrime investigations from your knowledge of how the office is structured? Are there additional investigators that need to be assigned anywhere? Are there different bureaus that need to be opened or closed? Um, anything, anything sort of on that front that would, that would signal sort of a, a different approach or uh, not at this time? The siloing of the office internally, as well as the siloing as compared to other agencies with whom it works, is something that I will radically change. So for example, the investigations division that handles long-term investigations and the trial division, which handles reactive investigations, use different case management systems that make it difficult to understand the intersections between cases. So that's the sort of siloing that I will dismantle as district attorney and make sure that everyone has the resources necessary to see when someone who is responsible for um, distribution of child sexual materials is also uh, potentially committing tax fraud. We need to figure out better ways to connect the information technology in that office and connect the expertise of the lawyers, clinicians, and support teams in that office, as well as to ensure that there are inputs from the relevant agencies, including, um, including the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and all of the other actors who are so critically important to building a new paradigm for public safety that is informed by public health and the kinds of changes that the public is calling for and that are long overdue. Are there ways that you would change how the office interacts with the police department? Are there different protocols you put in place? Are there different ways that you would handle the police officers that the, that the office works with, relies on for testimony? Any, any sort of big shifts in the relationship between the office and the PD that you're thinking about? 
I mentioned that I'm honored to have the endorsement of families who lost loved ones to police violence based on work that we did together to develop protocols for how prosecutors can ensure police accountability. So this is really a passion area for me. It requires not just radically changing the degree of transparency and communication with which the office handles instances of police brutality, but also changing the culture of the relationship between the district attorney's office and the police department. And I will make sure that the district attorney's office is part of training the police department with respect to what is expected, not just in terms of, of misconduct, but what is expected in terms of how people are treated and the ways in which people are spoken about. And that district attorney, assistant district attorneys are equipped to push back on police officers who have patterns, not just of outright misconduct, but of um, treating people poorly or not with respect or of using demeaning language towards community members. Those are ways in which the district attorney's office, in addition to ensuring accountability, can help change the culture of policing in the city. Unfortunately, in our last minute or so, I have two final short uh, questions for you. They, they, lend their, they lend themselves to longer answers, but we have to keep it short. Uh, one is, um, from what you've seen at this point, um, do you think the Manhattan district attorney's office has a strong case to bring against Donald Trump now uh, as a private citizen? The worst thing that the next district attorney could do would be to say something on the campaign trail to suggest any political motivation with respect to any case that district attorney will handle. I will say that I don't view uh, immunity from criminal liability to be an appropriate consolation prize for losing an election. But like my opponents, I know, do not know the facts of any pending investigations and would not deign to speak on them. Understood. And lastly, um, are there, you mentioned you have some endorsements from maybe some of these folks, but is there one or two people you'd point to either current or past that you consider role models, not necessarily somebody you agree with on 100% of things that doesn't, doesn't really happen, but um, Anybody you'd point to, you know, if folks want to obviously do more research about you, they can, but also anybody you'd point to who's either a current or former uh, leader in, in criminal justice that, that is a role model for you. I'm inspired by example by Sarah Fair George, the district attorney of Chittenden County, Vermont, who is just the second district attorney in the country to voluntarily do away with cash bail. I will emulate that example and intend to do away with cash bail by building out supervised release so that people can stay in the community while their cases are pending, but also have the supports they need to avoid future system engagement. Okay. Lucy Lang is a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you so much, Ben. I appreciate you having me. I am running to realize the full potential of what the Office of the District Attorney can be, prioritizing prevention, enhancing equity, and recognizing the dignity of every New Yorker. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to your audience. All right, thank you for being here. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in June and the fall. There's a lot on the line here for all of us across the city in city elections, as well as in Manhattan for this election for Manhattan District Attorney. There's a lot on the line. I hope this conversation has been helpful in sorting through your choices. Until next time, I'm Ben Max, goodbye.